welcome you on behalf of Zoravik Activist Collective to our second installment of Artsakh Updates with Professor Asturian. Our event today is being live streamed right now at facebook.com slash Zoravik, and it will be recorded and posted on the Zoravik Facebook page and YouTube channels for future viewing. So since we've spent much time with our expert, Dr. Stepan Asturian, I won't be reading you his bio today. I want to, however, express our thanks to Professor Asturian for updating us today. And we're just gonna jump right into the questions. Uh, in the last week, so the last time we spoke, uh, Dr. Asturian, Stepan, the last time we spoke was on Monday at the panel. However, we have not had an Artsakh update since last Wednesday. Can you update us on a few of the major developments in the last week? Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, the situation uh, on the front lines has changed uh, drastically and in a negative direction uh, for the Armenians. Uh, the Nagorno-Karabakh Armenians. Uh, there are two uh, directions uh, where uh, Azerbaijani troops have been advancing. It started with an attack uh, on the Lachin corridor. Uh, I would say about three, four days ago that looked very promising for the Azerbaijanis, you know, cutting that corridor will be a major, major problem for Karabakh um, because uh, its most important uh, link with Armenia will be cut. Uh, it looked very promising at first for the Azerbaijanis, but over the past uh, uh, two, three days, uh, they have stalled there. And then suddenly, uh, two days and a half ago, approximately, they launched an attack uh, from Hadrut. Uh, for those of you who don't know the geography, let's say Hadrut is uh, located to the south of uh, mountainous Karabakh and uh, slightly to the southeast of the area of uh, Shushi. Uh, and there, to my surprise, uh, when I woke up, uh, I believe it was two days ago, and uh, checked some of my uh, uh, sources, uh, uh, in one night they had been able to advance uh, somewhere around 10, 11 kilometers, and I saw the video of the president of uh, Nagorno-Karabakh, Arai Karutunyan, uh, uh, stating that uh, Azeri forces were within uh, five kilometers of Shushi. Uh, apparently, they moved there from the uh, direction of the village of Sirnak um, from the southeast. Uh, now, uh, and uh, Mr. Harutunyan was calling on everybody to come and uh, uh, protect. Uh, you know, Shushi uh, and the homeland. Uh, because of course, Shushi, for those of you who know, is located on top of, a, let's, I won't say mountain because it's uh, not a mountain, but uh, on top of a, a big rock. Uh, it is very difficult to capture uh, Shushi. Uh, essentially, there is one direction from which you can try to do it, uh, the Southeast, I believe. Two directions are quasi impossible. Uh, so it's like a fortress on top of a, a, a big rock. Uh, and uh, the second point is that, you know, when we are talking about five kilometers, you have to know that it's a mountainous area and it's not uh, the equivalent of five kilometers uh, on flatlands or in a desert. Uh, nonetheless, this is a very negative development. Um, and the last news, uh, this morning I checked, um, apparently they couldn't advance much more uh, uh, towards uh, Shushi, and there seems to have been uh, some uh, uh, minimal successes or successes in the direction of Lachin and Ber or Berzo in Armenian, you know. Uh, so this is the situation uh, on uh, the ground uh, at this point, it is uh, an open secret, uh, you know, that uh, Armenia has lost a number, uh, uh, Karabakh Armenians have uh, uh, basically lost a number of uh, provinces, 
where they were uh, located earlier, um, uh, Zangelan, Jabrail, Fuzuli, uh, most of Kubatla, I believe. Uh, and uh, what is left is uh, the Lachin with, uh, you know, a war there at this point, um, uh, Agdam, uh, and the northern area of uh, Kelbajar, uh, which is quite, um, uh, you know, mountainous also. Uh, and that's where uh, we stand. Now I am going to move to the main uh, diplomatic initiative. Uh, that's my uh, second point. Uh, that's uh, Iran. Uh, Iran has activated its uh, diplomacy and uh, right now, uh, yesterday in particular and uh, today, its uh, vice foreign minister, Mr. Abbas Arachchi, uh, has been uh, visiting uh, Baku, Yerevan, Moscow, uh, now I think he, uh, he, he was in Yerevan uh, yesterday. Um, what the Iranians are uh, proposing um, is basically uh, in substance to create a regional uh, conflict management group, Russia, Iran, Turkey, Armenia, Azerbaijan, in a nutshell to get rid of the Minsk group co-chairs uh, France, the United States, Russia, uh, and to try to settle that uh, conflict uh, uh, within this new group, which reminds one of another one that was formed uh, for Syria, known as the Astana group. You know, again, you had Turkey, Iran, and Russia. Uh, in that group, they tried to settle their um, uh, problems uh, in uh, Syria. Uh, this uh, uh, proposal, uh, which also relies on uh, uh, principles such as territorial integrity, protection of minorities, and so on, is unlikely to be accepted by Armenia, uh, because that would officialize the role of Turkey as an intermediary. And uh, obviously, uh, uh, how can Turkey be an intermediary when it is fully participating in this war? Uh, that is uh, uh, certainly uh, unacceptable from uh, the perspective of Armenia and uh, Nagorno-Karabakh. It may be also that the Iranian initiative serves other purposes. They have, uh, for centuries, they have had very deep diplomacy. So what you see is not always what you get. Uh, this might be, for example, also an initiative to counter the Turkish demands of joining the co-chairs of uh, the Minsk group, uh, presenting an alternative position whereby, you know, Iran is moving in and so on. Uh, so it's uh, hard to uh, tell. Uh, this uh, diplomatic initiative has been combined with the deployment of uh, uh, substantial Iranian troops along the Arax River, uh, including elite assault uh, brigades. And in particular, they have been concentrated also uh, near the uh, Khodaferin uh, Dam that, uh, you know, Azerbaijanis were able to capture, uh, I don't remember how many days ago, it was around six, seven days ago, five days ago, something like that. Mm -hmm. And they have also deployed their anti-aerial uh, weapons. Uh, so in case of trouble, uh, they, they are clearly indicating that uh, they will intervene. Uh, what type of trouble that might be, uh, uh, I would put my bets, even though I am not a gambler, on, for example, uh, Turkey uh, uh, moving into Nahichevan fully, openly, they are already there, uh, you know, but uh, let's say moving brigades there to attack Armenia, uh, that would be uh, unacceptable. Any attempt to change the border with Iran will be, uh, will lead to war. So that's the situation there. Third uh, point today, uh, 
Armenia uh, uh, and Armenians, including the Western oriented uh, Armenians, uh, they have now realized, I hope, because you know uh, it has been going on for uh, more than a century, that Europe is essentially irrelevant. Just yesterday, uh, uh, Miss Merkel blocked any type of sanctions against Turkey. Okay, and all the values that they are proclaiming and their comments about the reform of the constitutional court and this and that. Uh, now they have to realize what they are dealing with. Uh, there is nothing on the part of Europe. NATO just yesterday uh, congratulated Turkey on its uh, anniversary of the creation of the Republic uh, with the deep friendship between NATO and Turkey with a short message. Uh, it is quite clear that NATO or NATO members uh, either do not care or are very happy with the Turkish attack in the South Caucasus. After all, their obsession is Russia. Uh, and anything that weakens Russia uh, is good to them. Uh, the United States had be, has been missing in action for two, two and a half weeks. And then a few statements by Secretary Pompeo. Uh, then came... Uh, 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 moving statements on the part of President Trump, uh, how much he thinks highly of Armenians. Uh, uh, he loves them. They are wonderful people, beautiful people, actually. Uh, the Karabakh problem is very easy to solve. You know, there, there is no problem. Uh, uh, it's total emptiness. Uh, for example, the US could certainly uh, put pressure on Israel to stop uh, sending continuously every day. They are flights with new drones being sent to Azerbaijan. Uh, they haven't budged uh, an inch. Uh, so uh, uh, Ar Armenia and Armenians uh, uh, now uh, can assess the deep friendship uh, they enjoy on the part of the uh, West. Uh, so this is the situation insofar as the West is concerned. I keep reading articles in the Armenian press in Armenia. I, will, I mean website, the website versions of the press. Why isn't Russia uh, getting involved? Uh, another one yesterday wrote, we have to ask for the intervention of the uh, CSTO, the uh, uh, Fantosh. Uh, military organization around Russia made up of Central Asian states, Belarus, Armenia, and so on, uh, a kind of uh, Eastern NATO, which is not functioning at all. Uh, the issue is absolutely clear, and I am literally amazed. After uh, we have entered the fifth week of the conflict, I believe this is the 34th day or something like that. Okay. Uh, I, I, I have trouble understanding uh, how these people think. Russia has no treaty obligation toward ma mountainous Karabakh. The CSTO, even less. Uh, so on the basis of what are they asking? No, we are going, we have to ask them to intervene. Uh, I don't know at all. Uh, it's outright. Uh, mind-boggling, and uh, there are also uh, expressions of disappointment. Uh, why isn't Russia doing intervening and so on? Uh, Russia is likely to intervene if there is a frontal assault on Armenia itself. Uh, skirmishes, a few rockets, and so on. Uh, it's clear that that doesn't uh, suffice. Uh, and Russia is in a very difficult uh, position. Uh, it wants to keep the balance in the South Caucasus. I think it's already too late for that. I'm afraid, uh, with all due respect to their diplomats and so on, I think uh, Azerbaijan now uh, is clearly in the pockets of Turkey. It's a, it's a satellite of Turkey. Uh, and their game of... Uh, uh, keeping Azerbaijan and Armenia on their side 
via the unresolved Karabakh conflict, I think uh, it has essentially uh, failed. Uh, an intervention on the part of Russia, it seems to me, would mean that they would be a party to the conflict. And thus, uh, I suspect their position within the group of co-chairs of the Minsk group would turn problematic. You know? uh, naturally, uh, if it intervenes, it would automatically lose Azerbaijan. But as I told you, I believe that Azerbaijan is uh, de facto uh, gone. Uh, and of course, there is always the possibility of a major conflict. Uh, in addition, intervention is not that easy. Uh, the uh, Russian base uh, in Gumri is a very limited, it has some armament, some airplanes, some tanks, a uh, very limited number of personnel, about 5,000 people. It is very close to the Turkish border, so if there is a war with Turkey, I mean, that base is not exactly located uh, in Siberia, you know. Uh, uh, so, um, uh, Georgia has cut all uh, uh, help from Russia. Uh, uh, so, there are also technical problems for uh, the protection, uh, there are also different ways of doing it. I mean, there is a Caspian Sea with missile launching um, na Navy and so on. Uh, so, I, you know, I don't want to discuss military options. I am not a general. Uh, I don't know their plans. I don't know what they have were. But uh, what I have read that uh, Russia will have trouble intervening. Yeah, uh, there are complications. Uh, but I think if it uh, wants uh, to hit, uh, Russia can do it. Uh, and uh, that's it for this point. Uh, now, uh, there is, uh, since we are dealing with some of the foreign powers, you know, uh, Iran, uh, the so-called West, uh, uh, Russia, uh, let's go to Georgia. Uh, uh, Georgia pursues its tradition. Uh, uh, starting at the beginning uh, uh, during the First Republic. Uh, the, it is de facto uh, siding fully with Azerbaijan and uh, Turkey. Uh, those people who claim, uh, you know, we are friendly relations and so on, that they, you know, this is unsustainable love, okay? Uh, I like diplomacy, I like diplomatic language. Uh, uh, I have studied diplomatic history. Uh, but, you know, um, uh, you cannot paint a donkey and say uh, uh, it's a dinosaur, you know? Uh, so the reality is extremely uh, simple. Armenia is essentially surrounded by hostile uh, powers, okay? With the exception of that little corridor of Mary linking it with uh, Iran. So, uh, in case of a major conflagration, or if uh, uh, Turkey feels that it can do whatever it wants, the goal is not just Karabakh. I mentioned it, I believe, last time. The goal is to cut Zangezur and to establish a direct line of communication between Turkey, Nakhichevan, and mainland Azerbaijan. Okay, it seems to me it's absolutely clear. Uh, that's the first stage of a kind of uh, early 20th century pan-Turkish dream. And uh, for those Armenian scholars who used to laugh 20 years ago, there is a, ideology is not important, pan-Turkism, they were not pan turkish they were pragmatic, the Turks, during the genocide and so on. Uh, it thus happens that uh, there will be a meeting of the, uh, some kind of organization of Turkic states, and Mr. Erdogan, uh, on top of his agenda, there is uh, 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 the formation of an army of Turan. So you can check what, what Turan is. Uh, so we can see the, the project uh, taking uh, shape. Uh, this is a moment uh, of enthusiasm, uh, it would seem, uh, for Turkey. Mm, uh, whether uh, Mr. Erdogan uh, succeeds or not, I don't know. Uh, but I know uh, a Latin expression which has equivalence in other languages, which is 
nec quid nimis, which means nothing too much. Uh, this is the Greek understanding of hubris, that when uh, you go too far, usually it ends up uh, uh, poorly. Uh, so we'll see whether uh, Mr. Erdogan succeeds or not. But one thing is very clear now, uh, there is a ge real Georgian problem, so far as I'm concerned, sitting uh, 13,000 kilometers away. Uh, I don't think one can close one's eyes. I check the flights going to Georgia and from Georgia, from Israel to Azerbaijan. Uh, there are flights every day and they let them go enthusiastically because they don't know what's in the airplane, they say. Uh, so you, you can see what you are uh, dealing with. Uh, in turn, I think in the long run, uh, they might discover that uh, um, uh, thinking that they are crafty uh, will make them the, totally dependent on Azerbaijan and Turkey. Uh, but that might be in the medium uh, run. Uh, international survey, the role of Israel now is blatant. Uh, it's sold about uh, six billion dollars in weapons. Uh, I think the first contract was around 2012. Then there was another one, to oh, 2014. Then a big one around 2016, about five billion. They have been selling more after that. Now, selling weapons, all states uh, uh, do it. Uh, so you know, you just uh, cannot blame Israel for that. Uh, what is more problematic is that in the course of this war, uh, they keep sending more and more every day. Uh, and that comes in the context of uh, uh, Armenia uh, uh, re establishing diplomatic relations just uh, uh, when was it? Um, uh, not even two months ago, short lived diplomatic relations. So it is very clear that Israel's agenda is uh, totally different and uh, certainly uh, they couldn't care less about uh, Armenia. Uh, this having been said uh, as a short survey, there is another phenomenon that needs to be mentioned. Uh, I had noticed it, I noticed it already several weeks ago. There is in Armenia a group of people uh, uh, linked with the previous regimes of Mr. Kocharyan and Sarkisian, who uh, have been agitating uh, uh, 16 part, 14 parties or something, you know, uh, 12 of them are not even parties. They are uh, little groups around an individual. Uh, they have no representation outside the so-called Yerevan Gendron, uh, have come up with a proclamation to form a kind of national uh, salvation body. All of those parties together do not even have one deputy in the parliament. And they want that body to be, uh, to have decision making authority. As if there is no defense ministry, no foreign ministry, no generals in the army and so on. And they have been insisting on that and of course accusing Prime Minister uh, Pashinyan of rejecting national unity. Uh, and things like that. Elements linked with that uh, outfit uh, are agitating right and left. And just yesterday or the day before, I read an article of a, a quite wealthy Armenian businessman located in Moscow, naturally, who says, yeah, uh, the best thing that can be done now, Pashinyan has to immediately resign. The army has to take over. And uh, to bring a national salvation body, actually, we have that experience, he says, in Karabakh in 1992. This is an indirect reference to Mr. Kocharyan in 1992 in Karabakh. So what is being openly presented? I mean, I am amazed because something like that in France, in times of war, or in England, or I am sure in the United States, uh, um, would have very serious consequences uh, for those uh, people. You know, uh, I don't know what's going on, but then Armenian history is replete with that type of behavior. Uh, go and study, for example, the fall of Ani uh, 
during uh, the kingdom of the Bagratids. Yeah? Uh, and you'll see what happened at that time. Uh, that will tell you how uh, traditions continue. Finally, I don't mean to be a Monday morning quarterback, uh, you know, uh, living in relaxed uh, Northern California, enjoying life, uh, uh, not threatened by anybody. But this war also raises a question that is inevitable now. It has been mentioned in the press in Armenia. Uh, so I, do, I don't think it's a breakthrough. I refrain from uh, dealing with it uh, earlier because, uh, you know, uh, it's wrong to comment on things that you don't uh, master. And in times of war, it's uh, uh, totally counterproductive. Uh, but it has been it, it has been mentioned over the past few days uh, in Armenia openly. Uh, this war, its main characteristic is that uh, Armenia, uh, Nagorno-Karabakh, uh, uh, is not controlling the skies. You know, the Armenian army, uh, the skies are wide open. And uh, uh, they are getting those uh, drones, you know, suicide drones and so on uh, on their head. They are fighting heroically, but whenever they have solid assets, you know, like artillery, which is the traditional strength of the Armenian army, with those drones, they are sitting ducks. Uh, 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 so what is to ask uh, Mr. Serge Sarkisian? They knew starting around 2012, certainly after 2014, that Azerbaijan was buying billions of dollars of that type of weapon. And uh, I believe there is an intelligence service in Armenia there must be military intelligence, there was a government. Uh, the question that arises is why uh, they didn't get or they couldn't get or, you know, the answer is wide open. I don't mean to intrude into a, a highly uh, technical issue, but uh, it is because of that aerial dominance that uh, uh, the Armenian troops are confronted with uh, the uh, current situation. Finally, as I have uh, repeated several times, and that doesn't presume I know what the outcome of this conflict will be, a war hasn't ended until it has ended. Uh, to draw conclusions, um, uh, defeatist or uh, enthusiastic on the basis of positions at a given point in time is uh, often uh, totally wrong in times of war. When you, when you have studied the history of a number of wars, uh, that uh, becomes uh, absolutely obvious. Uh, and thus, we have to uh, wait and see how uh, uh, things uh, evolve. And that's it for today's update. Thank you, uh, Professor Asturian. Thank you, Stefan, for that update. Thank you for, uh, unfortunately, though the situation does sound quite dire from your update, it does sound like, uh, in some ways, uh, what, what I heard was Ar Armenia is surrounded by hostile powers. Things are looking very dire because territory has been lost. Um, and international powers, uh, the ones that we're looking to to help us are not. So, and this is the situation since the war started. Um, but things are looking a little dire for uh, Artsakh right now. But I, I'm actually thinking it might be interesting to hear your thoughts on something. You've updated us on what's going on in Artsakh itself. But I was wondering if you can describe the situation outside Artsakh in Armenia. And are there any developments that you've heard about in the diaspora recently? I'm thinking maybe France, for example. Are there any things that you would like to share share with our viewers today about um, what's going on in the diaspora? Uh, I, I cannot update you on uh, what uh, what's going on in Armenia. That is the mood 
of the population and so on. Last time I had some uh, reliable, uh, you know, information when I said there is massive uh, solidarity and so on. Uh, I suspect that continues. I am uh, quite confident in that regard. Uh, assessing the mood, uh, I just cannot do it from here. And at any rate, that is always uh, subjective. Uh, I can assume that, uh, uh, you know, over the years, uh, I have read, I don't know, countless articles by various people, interviews of different types of people, politician, former, uh, you know, veteran, uh, artist, uh, with, uh, you know, if Azerbaijan moves this time, we are moving to the Kura River straight if not Baku. Hmm? If Azerbaijan does this, we have the Iskander missiles, uh, we'll put them in their place and so on. Uh, uh, I was always amazed uh, to see this kind of uh, uh, grandiose uh, self-confidence, you know. Uh, I don't know where those people are now. Uh, in my mind, uh, uh, and again, it's not to teach lessons to anybody, it's just at the level of an individual. Stefan, uh, if I have an enemy, I never underestimate the enemy. I, I never uh, imagine that, uh, you know, uh, I am going to crush him and so on uh, very promptly. He cannot budge an inch and things like that. I think it's very bad to underestimate. Uh, a deadly enemy, hmm? uh, especially two plus a, a half, I would say, because now I am adding clearly Georgia to the list. Uh, you know, there is no point in playing uh, uh, diplomatic uh, games. Uh, in France, uh, very interesting events, uh, not totally related, but in my uh, in a town I know very well. Uh, two persons decapitated in the cathedral of Nice, uh, a third one, I believe, killed, plus a few wounded. Uh, mobs of uh, Turks taking to the streets. They are on video. You can watch them uh, looking for Armenians, uh, chasing Armenians at a time when there is curfew. Uh, I read an article, the police displaying Remarkable uh, cold bloodedness, it says, uh, sans froid. What I saw is that the police car was retreating. So it's remarkable uh, cold bloodedness, I would say. Uh, and there has been another such uh, mob uh, uh, march in another uh, city in France. I could also watch uh, the videos. Uh, all of this is part of a package, uh, the uh, Turkish and to a minimal extent, uh, the, uh, it's very small, the Azerbaijani diaspora in Europe, some of its elements have been organized uh, by Turkey for years actually. And now they are being activated uh, in this context. Um, and the target uh, seems to be uh, the uh, Armenians, uh, there was an attack with knives and a hammer, you know, uh, near Lyon, uh, so far as I remember. Uh, uh, so it's getting, um, this conflict has been exported to uh, the Turkish diaspora. And uh, I believe the type of actions that I can see on video, uh, their main goal is to instill uh, fear in the uh, Armenian diaspora communities, uh, to remind them of the 1995-96 mob massacres of the Hamidian period. You see, I think there is a very clear understanding of uh, uh, the psychology of uh, uh, Armenian survivors and their descendants, uh, and this type of action this is not hidden action, you see. It's not three Turks attacking uh, an Armenian, let's say, shopkeeper or whatever in the dark, fleeing. 
it's demonstrative. They want to be seen like that as 200, 250 people shouting, advancing. Hmm? Exactly, it's exactly like the Adana massacres of 1909 and the uh, uh, Hamid, so-called Hamidian massacres of 1905 or six. So I think there is an attempt here at uh, instilling fear in the diaspora. And that's how I, how I read uh, these actions. I suspect there will be more of them. Uh, thank you, Professor Asturian. Thank you, Stepan, for that update about what is going on in the diaspora and also uh, hearing, as you mentioned, this is a an act of instilling fear in the diaspora. Uh, the Turkish diaspora is in trying to instill fear in the Armenian diaspora who is protesting and has been protesting. For I, I would say some elements within the Turkish diaspora. Yes. Gray walls, uh, ultra nationalist, and so on. I wouldn't put the whole of the Turkish diaspora is attacking Armenians. Of course. Uh, that they are nationalists, no doubt about it. But uh, uh, let's be precise. You know, it's some elements, and it is uh, very clear what type of elements. Yes, I, as you mentioned, it is the hyper nationalistic elements, these gray wolves, the those that identify. They are making the signs, actually. So it's yeah. not a projection of uh, things, you know. They are making the signs during their demonstrations. I can tell you what it is. Here it is, you know, if you want. I am a gray wolf too here. Eh? Yes, we see this this hand motion, and we've seen it actually been made by uh, some governmental officials from Azerbaijan and Turkey. So it's important for us to pay attention to these signals being sent. Um, so I thank you, thank you, Stepan, for updating us on uh, what's going on outside of Artsakh as well. But that is also affecting the climate um, in terms of the support that we're seeing with, with some elements of the Turkish diaspora for this kind of uh, genocidal project, honestly. Uh, now, you mentioned uh, quickly the shifts and changes that you're noticing in the political climate in Armenia, uh, specifically about calls for uh, having Pashinyan step back or uh, other things like that. Is there anything else you'd like to share about that situation in Armenia that you've noticed? Uh, no, I, I believe that was uh, what became really blatant. I mean, I, I was observing it. I have been observing that for uh, weeks already, but it came to an apex over the past week. You know, it was wide open. Eh? Um, first, you have the proclamation of that group of uh, pseudo parties, most of them. Uh, then relayed from Moscow, you know, the call that the army should take over and then transfer power to the, some kind of national salvation uh, outfit. Uh, these things are not happening haphazardly. Uh, then suddenly, you know, Mr. Kocharyan is going to go to Moscow. Uh, you know, his uh, uh, demonstration that Moscow is gonna listen to Mr. Kocharyan, but uh, you know, he do Moscow doesn't want to deal with Mr. Pashinyan. If Mr. Kocharyan goes, immediately Moscow is going to intervene. Uh, all this theater, uh, uh, the attempt at bringing back uh, Mr. Kocharyan, because that's what's going on, okay, uh, is very well organized. Uh, I don't think it will uh, succeed, uh, but you never know, you know, in those situations. But it is absolutely clear to me that there are people in Armenia uh, who want to use this situation to put the blame on Pashinyan and uh, uh, get rid of him. That much I am uh, certain, uh, and that's it. Thank you for clearly explaining again uh, what what here is happening in Armenia, where we are seeing certain elements in Armenia using this as an opportunity uh, for an, another regime change or calling for another. Um, in any case, I think now we, I, I'm actually also interested in some of the, the developments we're seeing in the military um, use in, in terms of Azerbaijan's use of different uh, tactics to fight their war. 
Uh, I've noticed that there have been some reports about the use of phosphorus and other things like that. Do you know any other things that you can oh, share? Yeah, they are using uh, cluster bombs. Uh, they have been uh, just uh, uh, over the past day now in order to approach uh, Shushi. Uh, they have been burning whole villages, you know, that they have captured. Um, uh, so they are using uh, weapons uh, that uh, uh, you know are uh, the intent of which are uh, very clear. Uh, uh, burning whole places is a uh, ethnic cleansing uh, uh, practice, typical uh, practice uh, that tends to suggest what might happen if you know they succeed in advancing uh, uh, further uh, in in the near future. Uh, and uh, when Armenia shoots, you know, on their cities and so on, you immediately see in the Western press, horrible, horrible, they have shelled Barda, uh, a building fell, this and that. Uh, where have they been when uh, Stepanager, Shushi, other towns, civilian places have been shelled for weeks now? I don't recall having seen major articles, you know, that uh, this is terrible uh, and so on. Uh, so I can see the discrepancy in the, uh, uh, I would say, relations of influence, to use a, again my Marxist term, but instead of relations of production, relations of influence, it is very clear that Azerbaijan and Turkey have a wide network that has penetrated the press, the think tanks, and so on. Uh, and they can automatically relay something, and you can see it the next day in the press almost, okay, uh, to create outrage towards Armenians who are shelling civilian populations. I mean, this is horrible. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, that is something to keep in mind. Uh, you are uh, Armenians of Karabakh are faced with very well organized uh, system that has been organized for a very long time. Uh, uh, this is not a war that was devised, you know, just uh, in early July when they were organizing the military exercises in Nakhichevan and elsewhere with Turkey. This has been planned, coordinated uh, uh, way before those military exercises were, were meant to bring more armaments to Azerbaijan, to leave the F-16s there, and so on. Uh, and uh, if, uh, depending on how this war ends, uh, if it ends in the short term, uh, maybe it will, nobody knows, eh? but maybe it could turn into a war of attrition. Winter is going to start in that area. Uh, I don't know how the war is going to uh, evolve, uh, but uh, it is quite clear that in the future, uh, uh, the government of Armenia, uh, Karabakh government, uh, maybe some Armenian uh, or, uh, organizations of the diaspora, parties, philanthropic and so on, uh, uh, lobbying. Uh, you know, it is clear that in the information warfare, uh, uh, the Armenian voice is uh, quasi insignificant. Eh? So actually, I think I'll use that as a, a way to transition into our last question for today, which is uh, you mentioned, yes, these there's a discrepancy, a very clear discrepancy between who is controlling the narrative of this war. And there is uh, Azerbaijan and Turkey who have uh, the ability to control the narrative much more than we do, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. However, uh, I would like to actually ask you if you uh, the final question, which is about what we have recently seen in the New York Times. So just this week, there were two articles written and published by Carlo Rogal in the New York Times. Can you comment on her coverage for this newspaper and what you uh, have seen in terms of sometimes, as you mentioned, you know, this controlling of the narrative? What are we seeing here that is uh, affecting the U.S. Uh, affecting U.S. kind of public opinion of this war? And what what have you seen? Uh, in um, uh, that will come to you as a surprise, Lisa. Uh, but um, 
about a week ago, approximately, uh, I decided not to lose time reading what uh, this newspaper, that newspaper uh, is writing about uh, this uh, conflict. I, uh, uh, things were uh, absolutely clear to me uh, that uh, there is a substantial problem there. And it's not a problem of bias on my part, you know, assuming I am ethnically Armenian you know, and so on. I think there is organized, uh, an organized network of disinformation. There are participants. And I am not surprised at all. I was a witness of Middle East studies in the 80s, early 90s, uh, and so on, where the standard thing was to deny the Armenian genocide. And if uh, a scholar uh, gave a talk about that, uh, to ridicule him uh, during a panel in Middle East studies. And there were even Armenian scholars who participated in that game to portray themselves as detached. Uh, Armenian studies now it deals only with genocide and so on, that type of things. Uh, you have opportunists all over the place. Uh, Carlota Gal, I saw only one article. Uh, I don't want to comment on her. Uh, you know, uh, I think I have made my point about uh, what's going on in um, the production of news and knowledge. It's even worse when you, you go to think tanks or pseudo think tanks or pseudo uh, uh, peace-loving outfits uh, whose vocation is uh, uh, to solve conflicts. Uh, I think the Armenian position is even weaker uh, there. Uh, so there is a structural problem. I couldn't care less about Carlota Gal or Marlota Bal, you know. Uh, 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 it's one illustration of the overall uh, problem, uh, Lisa. Thank you for your frank answer. Uh, I, I'm also fully just outraged at what I've been seeing um, in terms of that, that mismanagement of, of the ability to share actual real information with their readers um, and mismanaging it such that Azerbaijan and Turkey end up being the victims in this situation. So uh, I agree, I'm also outraged, but I'm uh, so, so thank you for just reiterating that Carlo Regal, uh, that ar those articles, uh, we need not look at them and, and see them as truthful. Okay, so I wanna thank you, Professor Asturian for updating us on Artsakh this week. And to our viewers, I wanna say thank and, you. Uh, again. Mm -hmm. uh, Lisa, sorry for interrupting you. You said something just uh, 20 seconds ago you are enraged uh, and so on. Never be enraged. <laughs> Stay cool. Stay you know? cool. Yeah, just uh, no rage. Yeah. No, relax. No. Yeah. Stefan, I think, again, every time I talk to you, I feel uh, an ease and a calmness that I uh, I really do appreciate you sharing that, that calmness with all of us today. And yes, even though I do feel that I do feel a little bit of the rage, but every time I speak with you, you have a calmness about this that I really appreciate. And I, again, I want to say that most of us who are watching today feel that when we when we hear you, what you're, you speak and updating us. So thank you. So again, to our viewers, thanks for sharing your day with us, your morning, your evening, wherever you are. If you'd like to hear more from Professor Asturian, he, he actually was interviewed for a radio station here well, in uh, the United States, and it was, it's on the West Coast, KPFA. Uh, I think it, uh, it's syndicated in uh, all over the place, if I am not wrong. It's uh, yes, yes. Uh, Voices of the Middle East program. It yes, was yes. just broadcast here uh, from 11 to 12, actually. Uh, it will be rebroadcast re on uh, KPFA on Wednesday. That's the local station, but in Southern Cali California, there is the equivalent. I believe it's KPFK there and not A. And there are other, there is the Pacifica network mm -hmm. of uh, radios and maybe other ones. So if they are interested, it's a full one hour and the, the questions uh, were uh, very interesting, I would say. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, thank you for so mentioning. We'll, we'll find it. Uh, Zoravik, we will find the link to it and we'll post it on our uh, our Facebook page. So if you want to hear more from 
from Stepan, you will be able to listen to that interview. And I want to thank you all again for watching our Facebook live stream today. A recording of this installment is going to be posted on Facebook for, fu for future viewing, as well as on our YouTube channels. Uh, please share today's updates with everyone you know, and we will sign off for today, hoping for the best for nagorno karabakh for Artsakh. We'll see you at our next update uh, again, although we really hope we don't do too many of these. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Stefan. Thank you so much for updating us again today. Thank you and goodbye. Thanks.